to keep the territories as part of Israel without expelling the people. And that, of course, led to the third decision. If you keep the territories and you don't expel the people, what do you do with the people? Do you turn them into Israeli citizens? Do you annex officially the territories to Israel? And the third decision was to create what, and this is my words, not their words, but to create a mega prison. To create an amazing human invention that not only the Zionist ideology could produce. The idea that you can lock, lock at the time million and a half now, double the number of million and a half, that you can lock them in a regime that is similar to the concept of a prison with all kinds of variations on the, on, on the prison concept. It can be an open prison if the inmates behave themselves. They can even go and work outside, provided they come back to be in the prison at the end of the day. Uh, they can have autonomy in the prison. They can run their life as they wish, provided they accept the concept. Should they resist, the Israeli government would move quickly into a high security prison with all the punitive measures that uh, harsh uh, wardens would take against uh, inmates in such a situation. Under the army's protection and with the government's aid, Israeli settlements were erected in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Today, they cut through the Palestinian land and keep spreading. Some of them, like Ariel and Maale Adumim, are already considered to be cities. The purpose of these Jewish enclaves is to isolate and stifle Palestinian settlements. This is achieved also through roads for Jews only, military checkpoints, and land seizure. we want a Palestinian state, the Bantu stand, because we have to relieve ourselves of the Palestinian population, but it can't be a viable state. You see? And that's where the Bantu stand idea comes in. So there are four elements on the ground that have created that Bantu stand. And if you look at a map, we even have maps that show almost exactly the borders of this emerging Bantu stand. One are areas A and B. The areas that were reserved for Palestinians during Oslo, the Oslo peace process. And that locks the Palestinians into these islands already on about 42% of the West Bank. Then, in addition to creating the contours of the state by areas A and B, Israel has created massive settlement blocks. Seven settlement blocks, not just discrete individual settlements, but seven blocks that are consolidated, that then divide those areas A and B into islands, create Israeli corridors in between, and those settlement blocks will then be annexed to Israel. So Israel will essentially occupy 90% of the country, and the Palestinians will get 10% of the country in little tiny islands. That's the idea. That's the second element. The third element is the infrastructure. In other words, that Israel is building, with American, almost total American support, a $3 billion system of bypass roads and highways throughout the occupied territories that then link them physically into Israel proper. So that you create in the country, it's already been done pretty much, one urban fabric where the settlement blocks are an integral part of the metropolitan areas of Israel itself. One highway grid in which the bypass roads and highways of the West Bank and Gaza are integrated into those of Israel. One electrical system, one water system. So you create a situation on the ground where it's impossible to detach meaningful territory uh, from Israel for a Palestinian state. That's the third element. And the fourth element 
is uh, the wall that's being built. The wall that's being built that Israel calls a fence, because in some parts it's a massive fence, but when it comes to Palestinian populated areas, it becomes a wall. It's a wall twice as high as the Berlin Wall. A 24 foot high concrete wall that physically creates actual prison conditions for entire Palestinian cities, like Tul Karm and Kalkilia, cities of 70, 80,000 people, that alienates hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from their land, from their water. Uh, it has tremendous impact. But what this wall does, the separation wall, is that it then sets these uh, contours, these borders that have been set by the settlement blocks in areas A and B in concrete. So that it's a two billion dollar system linked to a three billion dollar highway system linked to I don't know how many billions of dollars in the settlements, all designed to close to close the Palestinians into these little tiny islands. The Palestinians rose up against the Israeli oppression in two popular uprisings, or intifadas. The first started in 1987 and ended in 1993. The Palestinians stood up to the Israeli oppression, extrajudicial killings, mass detentions, house demolitions, deportations, and land seizure. But they were no match for the well-equipped Israeli army. Over 1,100 Palestinians died during the uprising, and many more were imprisoned or expelled. The first intifada was put down by the Israeli government with so much brutality that the UN condemned Israel for violating the Geneva Conventions. The Intifada succeeded, however, in bringing the Palestinian case to the attention of the world. It also heralded the schizophrenic path that the Palestinian resistance would take from now on. While peaceful, non-violent demonstrations were conducted, suicide bombers entered Israel and blew up buses packed with people. The second intifada began in 2000 and continues until today. So far it has claimed the lives of over 5,300 Palestinians and over a thousand Israelis. While it was raging, the only true democratic elections in the whole Arab world took place in the West Bank and Gaza. <laughs> الأخ إسماعيل هنية قد منحت الثقة بالأغلبية المطلقة لأعضاء المجلس التشريعي Frustrated with their corrupt, stagnant government, Palestinians voted for the radical, fundamentalist Muslim party of Hamas. Hamas electoral victory was used by Israel to instigate a worldwide economic embargo against the Palestinians. Also at that time, 10,000 Jewish settlers were evacuated from the Gaza Strip. After the evacuation, the Strip was hermetically sealed and turned into the largest prison on the planet. Israel controls all sea, land, and air access to Gaza. It regularly cuts off all food, water, and power supply to the Strip. In order to punish the population for their defiance. 
in response to bombing by F-16 jets and Apache helicopter gunships targeted assassinations. Palestinians fire homemade rockets at Israeli settlements. The political and military elite of Israel since 1967 until 2008, 2008 has stuck to the same strategic decision about the occupied territories. That this area cannot be annexed to Israel as long as it has a large Palestinian population in it. This hasn't changed. This is still what Israel is all about when it comes to these two parts of Palestine, the West Bank and the Gaza. Secondly, that the Palestinians can at best be have an open prison concept that would even be called a state, that's okay, as long as they accept a total Israeli control of their life mm. through a bureaucracy that runs uh, every aspect of their being and existence, uh, where the main uh, uh, coin or the main trading card is collaboration with the bureaucracy in return for opening a kiosk, a business, going to university, being appointed as a teacher, going abroad, moving from one village to the other. This is the main formula. But it was decided upon in 1967, not contrary to what we hear today, that these are all Israeli measures that are countering uh, Palestinian terrorist attacks or violence. It's quite amazing how the history documents show that all these retaliatory, supposedly retaliatory Israeli actions were Israeli decisions against which the Palestinians retaliated. Not the other way around, including the war. The war was already decided upon in 1967. Mm -hmm. it was not, the war was not built as a reaction to the suicide bombs. The war was a natural consequence of the mega prison. Once it was clear that the Palestinians, by and large, are not happy with the mega prison. Or they took them 20 years to show it. Doesn't matter. But it was very clear. So, uh, in this respect, this is the second thing: is, is that the, the Israeli policy is about maintaining, perfecting the mega prison. And the inevitable happened. It really looks like a prison. Mm -hmm. It didn't look like a prison in 1967. It looks like a prison. The bureaucracy became really prison wardens. They were not to begin with. And finally, and with this I would end. The greatest, maybe, Israeli success, which I hope this meeting and others would prove that this is a failure, but it is not yet a failure. The greatest uh, uh, success is that 41 years onwards, these Israeli policies are not known. Definitely the fact that they were taken in 1967 and hasn't changed is not known. And that the Israeli, very simplistic to mind, not very sophisticated, very transparent lies about what they are doing that any intelligent person could easily decipher and expose for what they are, are still being repeated by the mainstream media in the West, including the Guardian, by, by the, all the tele mainstream television networks, including the BBC and ITV and Sky News and what have you, and is accepted by all the political elites of the West, including, of course, the British government. Today, Israel continues to steal Palestinian land in order to build more and more settlements. The security wall that Israel erected is instrumental in this, as it encloses a large portion of the West Bank's most fertile land. Three and a half million Palestinians live as virtual prisoners. In the eyes of the Israeli state, they have no basic human rights. Israel kidnaps and imprisons Palestinians on a daily basis. There are over 10,000 Palestinians in Israeli prisons. Men, women and children are killed almost daily for opposing the occupation.
The Israeli state, with its Zionist ideology, won't stop until the last Palestinian living in Palestine is expelled, imprisoned, controlled, or killed. The Palestinians who live in Israel are treated as second-class citizens. They are excluded from the society and are subjugated by racist policies. Now we're starting to see the settlement. This is the beginning of the settlement to be. They gave it in the name of Kidmat Zion, which is a very religious name. And it is uh, to absorb uh, around 250 housing units, which means nothing less than 15,000 new settlers. The settlers who moved here are members of the fanatic ideological settlement movement called Gosh Imunim. So those are the new neighbors that we have, the fanatic ideological settlers. And uh, you can see that they have not just the army to protect them and, you know, to, be, to enslave them, but also they have special uh, uh, guarding uh, agents that are sitting on top of their house. So we see that sometimes when the women are getting down to throw the garbage, she has, she has a bodyguard in front and the bodyguard behind. When the women and their children are moving out of the neighborhood, there is a bodyguard car in front and the bodyguard out behind. And those bodyguards, by the way, are not paid by the government. They are paid by my taxes as a taxpayer because these are private security companies for, that are you know, you know, paid by my taxes for special requests based on security needs. And of course, the security needs are not to protect me as a taxpayer, but to protect the illegal settlers that are moving on my land against my will. And that's the controversial reality that we here live in. Because these are not only the lands that were confiscated. Behind the mountain, you have a vast majority of lands that are owned by Abudis overnight were announced as confiscated areas for security reason and uh, they won't allow me to move around because at one point I'm sure the security will follow me but I wish I could take you you know like you see the wall zigzagging in and out Palestinians out Israelis and empty land in in order to grab all that empty lands for the expansion of a settlement to be Now, the bigger picture of Jerusalem that the Israeli municipality is not even hiding is the issue of metropolitan Jerusalem, the, the master plan 2020, 2020 for the metropolitan of Jerusalem, where if you follow the route of the wall, it is bringing Palestinian neighborhoods out and bringing illegal Israeli settlements in to the metropolitan of Jerusalem. For example, Abu Dis, you see how Abu Dis is adjacent to Jerusalem. It's like within walking distance, five minutes walking distance, you're in Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem. Internationally, historically, this is Jerusalem. But Abu Dis, with its population, you know, concentrated Palestinian population, is out of the master plan for Jerusalem, whereas Ma'ali Adumim settlement that is built on Abu Dis land, if, uh, you know, like five kilometers from here, is into the master plan of Jerusalem because of their Jewish majority or their Jewish existence. The same thing for uh, Bethlehem area. Bethlehem, the city of Jesus, is out of Jerusalem, you know, metropolitan, although it's 12 kilometers drive. It's like 12 minutes drive, literally, between center Jerusalem and center Bethlehem. But because it's concentrated Palestinian area, it is out of the metropolitan of Jerusalem. But Gosh Etzion blocks, settlement blocks, that are 20 kilometers away from Jerusalem, are within the metropolitan of Jerusalem because of their Jewish population. So the metropolitan of Jerusalem is so clear, racist, apartheid, whatever you want to call it, Jews in, Palestinians out. So this is the bigger picture, and the internal picture is with the Israeli Jewish fanatics that we have to deal in. So you have fanatics on the ground, you have fanatics at decision-making level. You tell me what is the way out.